tribal trails, tribal trails. The Son of God, He is near. He chose to walk with us. These tribal trails, tribal trails, tribal trails. Christ is a visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great! Hi, and welcome to Tribal Trails. We hope that you will be blessed by today's program. We will start with a short testimony from Georgina McDonald. She is in the hospital receiving dialysis. She will explain to us why she needs this done. And later, we will hear of how Christ's blood cleanses us. So let's listen as Georgina talks with her sister, Rita Anderson. Hello, Georgina. Hello. What are you doing? I'm on dialysis now. How long have you been on dialysis, Georgina? It's been close to six years. Yeah. And um, what does that do for you? It cleanses my blood because my kidneys don't work anymore. Yeah. So this machine takes my blood and cleans it and gives it back. How often are you on it? I um, have dialysis on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays for four hours each. That's only half a day. So the rest of the time, the rest of the week is mine. <laughs> is this really important that you have to do this? What if you miss? Mm, I'd get very, very sick and I wouldn't last very long. So the cleansing and the purifying of, of your blood is really, really important. Yes, it is very important. Just think of how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. In age to age he stands and Time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end God had three in one Father, Spirit, Son The Lion and the Lamb The Lion and the Lamb
How great is our God? Do you believe that our God is great? Then you will want to listen to the rest of the program. You just heard a short testimony from Georgina of how dialysis helps to clean her blood because her kidneys are not working. You will also hear of how God made a way to cover the sins of all nations. In Romans 3.25, it says here, For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. Art will share with us how Christ provided a way of salvation for all people from the beginning of creation. Hello, my name is Art Wanich, and today we're going to go through the time chart of human history. The time chart of human history is a depiction, as recorded in the Bible, of the history of mankind and certain of the major events that go through up to and including the crucifixion of Jesus Christ onwards up to modern day time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the uh, fall of Adam and Eve and we're going to go through to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And what we're going to talk about here is the holiness of God. In the beginning when God created Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were sinless. Adam and Eve had a holiness that was equal to God. And God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And then at the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They rebelled against God. And as a punishment that caused the separation between God and man, man was no longer perfect. Man was no longer sinless. Man no longer had a holiness equal to God. And God could not tolerate that. God could not tolerate sin. And so the separation happened. But because God loved man so much, he told man that the day that you eat of that tree, the fruit of that tree, you shall surely die. And when Satan came into the picture, he said the exact opposite. He said, you shall not surely die. God had said they would surely die. Satan said they would not surely die. The exact opposite. So Adam and Eve had a decision to make. And they decided to test, to try, and they ate the fruit. That's called rebellion and sin. Man went their own way. Now that separation, God came and talked to Adam and Eve, and instead of allowing Adam and Eve to pay for that sin, God took an animal and killed that animal as a substitutionary death. There was the payment for that sin. The sentence was carried out. There was a death, but it wasn't the death of Adam and Eve. It was the death of this innocent, sinless animal. And God used the skins of that animal to clothe Adam and Eve, to cover them so that they could stand before him covered with his provision, what he provided. And with that, they were evicted from the garden. And from that point on, there was the introduction of the sacrificing of animals to cover man's sin. And that's what we read about where we read about Cain and Abel, and Abel bringing the sacrifice of an animal, coming to God, God's way. And here we read about Cain, who also brought a sacrifice, but Cain brought fruits and vegetables. God, uh, Cain coming to God his way, man coming to God man's way. And so God didn't accept the uh, fruits and vegetables. In the garden, Adam and Eve came to God with fig leaves, clothing of fig leaves. They came before God their way. God had them remove that, provided them with the uh, coats of skin. Cain came with fruits and vegetables coming his way. God did not accept that. God accepted Abel's sacrifice of an animal, the way God had prescribed them to come before him. And here we read about where Cain kills Abel. And this incident is the introduction of the first death, the first murder in the Bible of mankind. And we go through and the history of mankind gets worse and worse and worse. But this uh, provision that God provided man to come before him, his way, this provision of a sacrifice was carried on all through human history. We have this uh, continuation of this blood sacrifice until we get past the flood, until we get past the Tower of Babel, we get the dispersion of the nations, we get the calling of Abraham, and we have the Jewish people. 
God's people through whom God was going to show the world how God interacts with mankind. That's the picture of the Jews. How does God interact with mankind? And all through the Old Testament, we read about that. We get to the point where in the wilderness, after the slavery in Egypt, the 10 plagues, the uh, Pharaoh releasing the Israelites, we have them in the midst of the wilderness, in the, jungle, in the desert, and God gives them the building plans for the tabernacle. He told them what they needed, how to build it. It was going to have a seven foot uh, fence all around. It was a compound. There were a certain people group that became his priests, the Levites. There wasn't anything special about the Levites, but God didn't want just anybody looking after his temple. He wanted this to be a special uh, place. And so he had a priesthood developed that was just made to, and their job, their function was to look after the tabernacle. Now what happened here was we have the people groups encamped around the tabernacle. And every month, the leader of the, of the family was to bring an animal, either a sheep or a, or a bull, would come in through the one gate. This tabernacle was always set up with a gate facing the east. And so when you came into the tabernacle, you always came in uh, through the east, through the one gate, the one door, into the, into the compound. The first piece of furniture you saw there was the bronze altar. And on the right-hand side of the bronze altar is where you, the person offering the sacrifice, would have to slay the animal. And when you did that, you, prior to slaying the animal, you put your hand on the animal's head, on the sacrifice's head, and you both faced God, you and the animal, facing God, facing the Holy of Holies, where God symbolically dwelled with man. And you recited the prayer of thanking God that he was providing a way, and your hand on the head of this animal symbolically moved your sin from you into this sacrifice, into this innocent animal, and that animal died as a payment on behalf of your sin. Now the leaders of the family, the leaders of the household had to do this each month because the blood of these animals never took away sin, but they provided an atonement cover, a cover that God provided for them. And as long as they followed through with uh, bringing these animals and uh, obeying God, that coverage was there, their sin was covered, they could stand before God and God would not look at their sin. Like Adam and Eve, when he saw his provision, the skins of the animals, the, the, the blood of the animal had paid for their sin. The same thing was in, in force here. And by faith, these people were trusting that God would protect them, that God would cover them, that God would honor their obedience of slaying this animal. And then there were different rituals that the high priest would take the blood, rub it on the four posts, and they would burn the animal. Now, where God dwelled with man in the tabernacle, there was the, the holy place, which had the, uh, the candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. And behind the altar of incense was the holy of holies, where God symbolically lived above the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had on it two cherubim with their wings overstretched over top of the cover. And there, God symbolically dwelt. And once a year, just once a year, one day of the year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was instructed to come into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle blood on the atonement cover. And that was a covering for the nation of Israel that the high priest held. Just as the family came with one animal for the whole family, the high priest would come with one batch of blood for the whole nation of Israel. And that was... That's what would take place there. Now, when God, symbolically living above the, the Ark of the Covenant, would look down on the people, the nation of Israel, what we had contained in the, in the actual Ark, the three things that were in there, were the two tablets containing the Ten Commandments. There was a golden pot full of manna, manna that God provided for the families each day in the wilderness. And later on, we have Aaron's rod as the three implements that were in the Ark of the Covenant. And what these three things symbolized, the uh, tablets of God, 
the, the rules by which these people were to be his people, to live by his rules, they broke covenants that, that were made in those commandments and they broke all of them. So that was the sin of Israel, was that they couldn't live in obedience to these rules. Then we have the manna, which God provided. God provided food for them, sustained them. And instead of being grateful for that, they grumbled and they complained and they wanted, they wanted meat. They wanted other things. So here they were grumbling and complaining at his provision. And eventually the, uh, the rod of Aaron, the staff of Aaron, was put in there as a memorial to Israel grumbling. They wanted their own, uh, they wanted different people to be their high priest. But God had chosen Aaron and his uh, sons. And so as a way of confirming that this was God's selection, he had the families of all the tribes bring their, their staffs, their leader staffs, and they put their names on them. They put them in the holy place. And then in the morning, God would show them who his choice was. And sure enough, when they came in the morning to get their staffs, Aaron's rod had uh, not only budded, but had produced almonds. And so this was God verifying that Aaron was his choice. So the people, again, this was a symbol of their sin, the nation of Israel. So these three implements in here, the tablets of stone, the pot of manna, and the rod of Aaron were symbols of Israel's sin. So what happened with the depiction each year that Aaron came in and sprinkled blood on the atonement cover was really emblematic or symbolic of God looking down on the nation of Israel, but not seeing their sin, but seeing his provision, the blood of this, this uh, bull on the atonement cover. God, again, by faith, the people obeyed and came to God, God's way, and God preserved them. So what that did, as we said, this, the blood of bulls and goats does not take away sin. It covered the sin. The sin was still there. It wasn't gone. And what happened all the way from the beginning, from Adam and Eve, from Abel, from all the other people, all through history, when they were offering their blood sacrifices, coming to God His way, they were believing by faith that their sins were covered. And God, for His part, took those sins and didn't remove them because they were just covered. But He kept moving them on and on and on. And here, through the tabernacle in the wilderness, taking their sin, moving them on, moving them on, moving them on, until we get to the Lamb of God, His sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ, where all the sins of all the people that had lived beforehand who were looking forward to the day that Jesus Christ would take all their sins. And that's what happened, was God took all of those sins because they were only covered, they were not removed. God took those sins, put them on His Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God sent his son to us. His every child he reconciled To pardon from our sins Oh, love of God, how rich and pure How measureless and strong It shall forevermore endure The saints and angels song skies of parchment made were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll stretch from sky to sky oh love of god how rich and pure 
how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forever saints and angels song the saints and angels song how true it is that the love of god is measureless and strong do you believe in the love of god you have just heard of how god has provided a way of salvation from the time of creation and will continue to do so till the time of his soon return because of his love for us, Jesus died on a cross to provide a way of salvation for all eternity. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says here, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Now us here, future from then, this incident passed for us by faith. The same as those people beforehand who by faith were looking forward, we by faith look back to the work that was done on the cross, Jesus Christ, who paid for all the sins of the world, past, present at his time, and future, our time and future, past, present, and future, all the sins of the world came to rest on his shoulders so that when he died, when God accepted that payment, that suffering, that blood on the cross, when God accepted that as the ultimate payment for sin, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The penalty was paid. God was satisfied. God can declare you righteous before him. God doesn't see your sin because your sin is not there. Your sin was taken, put on the shoulders of Jesus Christ, paid for. And what's left with us, if we're sinless, if we're sinless, then it's back to being when God created Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve were innocent, when Adam and Eve had holiness equal to God's holiness. That's where we are today. When we display, when we talk about, when we have faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior, at that moment, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, to secure us for eternity with God. And we have a righteousness, Christ's righteousness, and uh, that confirms that we have our eternal salvation. That's the meaning of the word eternal salvation. Eternal means forever. Once you're saved, the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, we become the temple of God. Like the tabernacle in the wilderness was the symbolic temple of God living with mankind. Now, with the New Testament, the new covenant, we become the temple of God, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, holding us secure, pure, until we're either Christ comes back for us or we die and we go into eternal time with God in heaven. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound the time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair and the sailors shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is calling me under I'll be there when the roll is calling me under when the roll
Thank you for listening today. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, it says, Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Are you wanting to be washed with pure water? Do you want to be set free from your guilty conscience? then turn your life to Jesus today. If you need to talk to someone, give us a call. I would like to leave you with this promise in Romans 5, verse 9. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Jeez.